Okay, so now I'm recording. Hello and welcome everyone to this evening's webinar. Um, Engineers Ireland is delighted to present a career as a chemical engineer. Um, if, if anyone has any questions about the webinar, my contact details are mgallagher at Engineers Ireland and I'd love to hear about, from you about how you thought this webinar was. Um, so yeah, let's, uh, t t for this evening's talk, we have uh, three fantastic speakers, uh, Caroline, David and Philip, who will all be giving kind of different perspectives into um, the career as a chemical engineer. Uh, Caroline has recently finished up in uh, Queen's University Belfast in the last year or two uh, with her her MEng in chemical engineering. So she'll be giving the insight of uh, someone who has graduate experience uh, both um, kind of pre-COVID and post-COVID kind of talking around that their perspective. Uh, David um, will be speaking from the perspective of someone who has uh, nearly 15 years uh, experience um, as a chemical engineer. So a bit further down the line and some of the tips from his own career in chemical engineering uh, that you might apply as uh, final year students and early career graduates as you kind of pro progress in your own career. And finally, we're delighted to be joined by uh, Philip Healy, who is um, the uh, chairman of the Ireland uh, branch of uh, ICME and also a member of Engineers Ireland, who will be uh, kind of tying the whole talk together and uh, talking from um, a wealth of experience um, from his own career as a chemical engineer and uh, maybe picking out different elements that uh, Caroline and David might talk about during their event. So for everyone joining this evening and watching back on the recording, just a reminder that the free graduate transfer is still available. So if you're graduating in 2021, this summer you can graduate for free and or rather you can transfer to full membership for free and you can get your first um, four years heavily discounted. And we do this because we're invested in your long-term professional development here in Engineers Ireland. Um, you can do this by logging into your membership profile and uh, just clicking on the become a full member uh, button. So if you already have a student membership, that's how you can become a full member. Um, and yet we're already uh, coming to the end of my uh, segment. I just really, as Caroline kicks off, I really want to thank her again. And um, because it was her fantastic article in the Silicon Republic during Engineers Week that was the real catalyst for bringing this event together. And um, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen now and I'm going to invite Caroline to uh, begin her presentation. So thanks very much. Yeah, thanks, Michal. I hope you can see my screen there. Yeah, I can see it. Now it's in the it's in the PowerPoint format. Uh, yeah, that looks perfect. Yeah. Okay. Um, perfect. Um, so hi everyone. Uh, I hope you're all keeping well. Um, I'd like to start by saying thank you to Michal and Engineers Ireland for giving me this opportunity to share my career journey. Um, by way of introduction, my name is Caroline Pavel. Um, I currently work as a chemical engineer for MSD Ballydyne and I'm an MEng graduate from Queen's University Belfast. Um, so just to start off, before I start off, I've kind of formatted this presentation to kind of give you a glimpse into what I was thinking at different stages of my life and how they shape my career choices. Uh, so that's how the presentation is formatted. Um, so to start, I am originally Indian. I grew up in the Middle East on the tiny island of Bahrain. Those of you who watched the Formula One probably know where that is, otherwise you might not. Um, but this is where I did all of my pre-university schooling. Um, when I was in school, I really wanted to be a doctor. Um, and when I think about it, the deeper reason for that would, would have been, I really wanted to help people. And I thought the only best way to achieve that was either by being a doctor or some form of a medical care professional. But um, I would have spent countless hours researching what my options were and then stumble upon uh, the option of pursuing drug discovery research. Um, and then did some more research and decided to do that through chemical engineering versus the traditional route of medicinal chemistry. Um, so to do that, um, I decided to have continents and go and study Northern Ireland at Queen's University. Um, my choice of university was primarily um, uh, driven by the fact that they were offering the five-year MEng pathway that was ICME accredited, um, but then they were also a part of the Russell Group, you know, the Russell Group, um, uh, and that pretty much means that they have an intense focus on research and innovation, um, as, and that met my um, my needs as I was trying to get into research eventually. And um, the ICME accreditation was important to me as I do hope to get chartered in the next couple of years as I progress my career. Um, so I had three main goals in university. Um, the first was to diversify my education. 
So along with studying my degree, I took evening classes in Arabic and German. It just helped me to get more exposure and to kind of expand on my degree and gain extra skills and build a network. Um, and I was also able in my second year to go abroad and study chemical engineering in Canada. So I did my second year at the University of Alberta in Edmonton. Um, it was probably one of my favorite years of college. Um, I was exposed to a completely different method of um, education, um, especially in chemical engineering. I would, I would, the way I would describe it is, it's almost like lectures are like motivational speakers. So you kind of go into class, you get very hyped about your the topic you're being taught, like I don't know, fluid mechanics, thermodynamics, and then you come back and you actually have to do your own kind of self study to prepare for exams. You would never, you could never pass an exam by just reading slides or, you know, following course um, course content. Uh, you have to go outside and do your own kind of study, and uh, that really helped my like study methods and it improved my work ethic as well. So it was it was really great opportunity opportunity to go abroad. Um, so that was that was that goal, and then my second goal um, at college was to try and get an insight into what industrial engineering looked like. Um, this I was able to achieve by completing a year of an industrial placement with MSV Ballydown. Um, this was in my fourth year. Um, I did a placement at MSV Ballydown, um, knowing that I did want to get into research eventually. And what I was thinking at that time was by doing an industrial placement. I could have that experience in my back pocket um, while I pursued research or tried to pursue an ac academic career. Um, so that was the thought process there. Um, and then the final goal, obviously, was to try and understand what research looked like, what like uh, to try and get a glimpse of what like a PhD in chemical engineering could look like. And that I was able to do by completing a final year research project in my fifth year. Um, so just to quickly go over my final year research oh. project was to develop a continuous near plug flow crystallizer. I know those are all big words, um, words you'll probably have come across in your reactor design and engineering modules. But um, so my the objective of my research project was to basically identify a reactor model, um, a continuous reactor model that in, which could offer uh, near plug flow characteristics, and then to demonstrate cooling crystallization in uh, for paracetamol ethanol system. And uh, we were able to de demonstrate this successfully, uh, but um, not, not to go into too much detail of the project itself, because that's probably irrelevant for this presentation. Um, but through this experience, I was able to kind of get like a, a kind of flavor for what um, our research project could look like. This could have potentially been a four-year project where I developed the design and you know brought it through to you know fully operational standards, um, and this was also a very relevant uh, research project at the time, as as industry is currently, especially the farming industry is currently looking at continuous manufacturing and continuous crystallization and the like. Um, but because this this research project was done the year after I did my industrial placement. Um, because during my industrial placement, I was able to run processes and work in a very fast-paced, dynamic environment. I really did want to return to industry. Um, so I did put all of my uh, goals on pause there and decided to return to MSD Valley Dine for the graduate development program. Um, so I didn't describe my industrial placement year separately because the industrial placement was pretty much just a shadow of what I do at the moment. Um, just limit, like smaller responsibilities, but very much the same thing as what I'm doing at the moment. Um, so currently, so MSG Valley Dime, basically there's three different departments on site that you can come in as a student engineer or as a, as a graduate engineer. So there's the API technical group, which is a group I work in at the moment. There's a, a process development and commercialization group where you work on new products, on the sprayer or on tech tra transfers from different mark sites or LSD sites. Um, and there's also a formulation facility where we, we tablet some of the drugs that we make on site. Um, so I work on the API technical group where we make the drug product. Um, and as part of my role in the technical group, I work as part of a process team where there's a process technical lead, a process chemist, and then a process body uh, specialist. Um, in this team, um, I would be the only person that's dedicated to a process. Uh, when you come in the door after your onboarding, which, which will roughly take like one or two months, um, you'll, like, you'll immediately be given a process to manage and oversee. Um, it is a big responsibility, but at the same time, um, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great and challenging learning curve. Um, so you get your own process to run and you're pretty much the, you're pretty much responsible for the oversight of the process because you're the only person 
um, dedicated to that process, whereas everyone else, the lead, the chemist, the body person, they kind of manage several different processes. Um, and as part of this role, I'd be responsible, my goal role would be to uh, prepare documentation for processing, so batch sheets and recipes. Um, batch sheets are pretty much just um, instructions for operations or operators to go and execute uh, processing activities. Um, it could be like adjust temperature of this vessel or, you know, age this vessel for 10 hours. Um, or take a sample from this vessel. And then the recipe is just the automation sequence that supports the batch sheet. Um, so it like it, it basically tells us to open close, um, you know, monitor temperatures during crystallization operations. Um, so that's like it, it, that would be my core role. There's no one else that does that job. Um, and then uh, supporting that, um, I would also have to field any issues that happen on the process. So Say, for example, uh, we're completing a reaction in a mass cell and the batch fails for end of reaction for conversion, then it would be my responsibility to start an RCA, work with my process team um, to try and work through RCA tools and identify the root cause and then implement corrective actions while managing the batch that is in the train, the equipment train. Um, I would also be responsible for supporting change over and cleaning. In Balidine, the equipment trains are not hard piped to each other, they're connected by flexibles. Um, it allows for flexibility so you can make multiple processes using the same, same bits of equipment. Um, but um, it also means there is a good churn in the amount of work that's involved because you set up a processing, you de-set up after processing, then you set up for cleaning, de-set up for cleaning. Um, so there's a good amount of work there and then it would be my responsibility to, to generate the documentation first and, and make sure that everything happens safely. Um, um, I'd also be the operations point of contact for um, anything that happens on the process. If they have any questions um, on the documentation or if they have any feedback, um, I, they would come back to the process engineer as I'm like, I'd be the link between operations and my process team. Um, Seeing an agitator seal fails, it would be it would be me that, that would have to go on with the maintenance team to try and identify the fix and get the vessel back into processing without any delays. Um, as well as that, we're also encouraged to implement process, uh, identify and imp implement process improvements. Uh, these typically look like yield and cycle time improvements, so increasing the yield of a, of a, pro of a batch or, you know, reducing the start to end times of a process campaign. Um, but they could also look like reducing solvent use during cleaning, um, etc. So um, we're always encouraged to keep an eye out for improvements in the process. Um, so that's kind of like the overview of my technical role on a day-to-day -day basis. But apart from that, um, this is not at all mandatory. No one ever asks you to do it. But I also have voluntarily involved um, and contributed time to different uh, groups on site. So I'd be an active part of the diversity and inclusion team on site. Um, and we're actively working on different initiatives um, around the site to you know, improve culture, get people together, uh, get people um, included in meetings and events and make people be more included on site. Um, I'm also part of the coaching circles um, that is hosted by the Mark Women's Network. Um, Last year, I was able to take on the opportunity of being the newsletter editor for our site communication team. Um, and then I'm, current, I'm currently also involved in our European mentorship program where I'm being I'm paired with um, an associate director, director level um, um, employee of Mark outside, uh, outside Ireland. She's based in Austria at the moment. Um, so yeah, there's like a range of like opportunities there to get involved in uh, like non-technical stuff to grow your skills and to improve your network. Um, so what all this means for my overall objective, um, so my overall objective has kind of slight, slightly shifted. I, I, do, I still do want to do R&D in the future and that's still a long-term goal. Um, it is no longer drug discovery itself. It is just like I would love to work in a space that, where I can improve drug manufacturing methods um, and that is still the overall goal. So the aim at the moment is to just keep my head down and keep learning. Um, it like I'm still very much interested to learn more about you know the small details of manufacturing operations. There's so much to it, even though I have spent nearly two years now in industry. In my existing role, there's still always something new to learn every day. Um, and then again, to just keep looking for opportunities to continue growing and developing um, as an engineer. So that is all I have for today. Um, I, those are my contact details if you ever wish to contact me directly, but I believe there's also a space for questions at the end, so do feel free to ask away.
but um, I'm ha I'll hand it back to Emmy Hall now. Well, thank you so much, Caroline. That was really, uh, really fantastic. And while uh, David's preparing his presentation, I might just uh, kind of summarise some of my uh, some of my thoughts and reflections. But yeah, just incredible to hear about your journey uh, coming across the world to come and study and work on the island of Ireland. Um, I really thought your final year research project was uh, really, uh, really cool. I think a lot of the uh, students who are on the call or the um, students who are watching back on recording, it would be nice to be able for them to see how their um, how their final year projects can can really kind of uh, impact on their like their early career uh, learnings and everything. Um, your industrial placement year and your grad development program, they both sound incredible, so varied, um, so many different opportunities to learn. And I guess, yeah, for the questions and answers part at the end, I'll definitely be asking about both your work with the diversity inclusion um, committee and also like there sounds to be some really incredible things going on with the co coaching circle and everything. Um, so David, I'm ready to hand over to you if your uh, presentation is ready for sharing. Um, and um, I hope uh, all is going well. I can see that the screen is sharing now. It's looking perfect. And um, I think all you need to do now, David, is unmute yourself and I will mute myself. All I need to do now is uh, cycle back about a week and really put a lot more preparation <laughs> into this presentation. That was unbelievable, Caroline. Um, I wish I had gone first. Um, so my name is David McGettigan. I work for Pfizer uh, in the biotech sector in the Grange Castle Industrial Estate. Um, I've been there for five and a half years currently. Um, I've had a career as a chemical engineer since 2006 when I graduated from UCD. Uh, so uh, 2002 to 2006 in UCD, University College Dublin. Um, it was uh, a lot of fun, made some good friends, really interesting course, enjoyed it a lot. Uh, at the time I was, you know, a little bit tired from 40 plus hours a week, labs, classes, uh, like 20 different subjects, a difficult final year with uh, research and design projects. Uh, in hindsight now, I can see that it was uh, brilliant. It really encouraged a high level of problem solving, uh, adaptive thinking and uh, a lot of kind of networking with people that are now in the same industry as myself. So when I was looking back on this, I realized that my memory is like a sieve and uh, that my wife has been right for years that uh, I have a shocking lack of recollection. Uh, so I started looking at old CVs and some work journals that I've kept over the years. So it's mostly accurate, I hope. Uh, as a chemical engineer, from UCD, you're probably looking at three main types of industries, or at least that's what people think. The pharma, biopharma sector, maybe oil and gas or energy or brewing. And I just took a quick uh, count from my class to see who's doing what at the minute. And uh, the kind of breakdown of what I could remember, some people are doing process uh, design engineering, you know, in the pharma sector. There's a couple of people doing automation, uh, IT and controls couple of project managers, uh, project managers across uh, different industries. CQV and validation is a, is a big one. A lot of leadership uh, roles and management roles now have been filled by people, site leads and uh, directors of strategy and innovation. <clears throat> people management, um, people are leaving their technical roles and going into leadership. Fire safety engineering uh, in the oil industry. Um, and then just regional roles with oil and gas. Uh, my favorite one is uh, my, my wife's cousin's wife, who's in the brewing quality management at Guinness. Uh, love that. And a friend of mine recently joined uh, CRU, the energy regulator. Um, and I, uh, one person I know is a health economist in London. The careers you can have out of chemical engineering uh, span across the world. It's a great skill set to have. Uh, the variety of topics you cover during college literally cover dozens and dozens of industries. And, you're usually quite sought out um, because of your diverse knowledge or your learning ability or your, your ability to adapt to new situations. I have a mechanical engineer brother-in-law who's probably uh, chewing on a chewing on something at the minute, listening to me talk. Uh, after I left college, I you know took a holiday, I suppose, and then uh, after the summer was over, I started working Pfizer and Dunleary. Uh, at that point, they were installing a what they call the PM2, Production Module 2 facility, which is a, an aseptic fill finish facility. Um, that type of manufacturing uh, would be filling of syringes and vials with uh, maybe in that case, I think it was a, it was a protein product. 
uh, that was that was really interesting. It was great to keep your foot in the door, um, to actually, you know, see what a GMP environment is like. Up until this point, everything was theoretical. You, what you learn in college, you know, is usually a problem statement with a simple answer. But this is working in a highly regulated industry where everything needs to be proven. Um, so, you know, that kind of mindset is hard to see from the outside. But once you get a chance to get in there and actually do a bit of work in the environment, you can see uh, the nuts and bolts and cogs and wheels and how everything fits together. In this particular uh, job, I was working on uh, as a tech writer. So a tech writer is someone who might write SOP, standard operating procedures, which are instructions to tell, say, operations how to run machines or do a process. And also uh, MBRs, master batch records, which are the, the official batch documentation to prove that everything was done as per you know spec. So that when you eventually get to ship out the batch, you can sign it off and say that everything's correct and you've met all your regulatory requirements. Towards the end of that role, I was working as a validation engineer. Uh, validation is, is uh, the proof that something has been done correctly. And usually in triplicate, uh, it involves drafting documentation, uh, learning about equipment, executing uh, testing on the floor. In that case, I was um, working on the pyrogenation tunnel, uh, which is a, a method of heat sterilization for vials. And the vials are then transported through an automatic conveyor belt system through to the filling line. Um, so that particular role involved thermal mapping, thermal qualification, which is the proof that the vials actually get to the correct temperature to kill any uh, bio burden that may be lying on the surface or endotoxin that might be lying on the surface of the glassware. It's a dry heat type of sterilization, um, which is not commonly used, um, but in this case, it's the safest way of doing it. Uh, other things I learned from that job, I suppose, um, working in a GMP environment, extremely important. Uh, some of the technologies that they used uh, were really cool. They had uh, robotic arms inside the RABS isolator, restricted access barrier system isolator. Um, the interaction with each of the components that make up a syringe or vial of medicine um, is so restricted. It's, it's controlled using HVAC unidirectional flow of air to blow particles away from it, you know, away from the, 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 the material itself. Uh, everything's tested regularly, environmental monitoring is completed. It's a huge, huge undertaking to do this, but just, you know, through osmosis, trying to absorb the fact that everything you see and do in an environment like that has been thought out and is important and is there for a reason, which is very, you know, very different than anything I'd encountered before. Uh, after about two years at Pfizer, I, uh, I went to Wyeth and Newbridge. Uh, Wyeth and Newbridge at the time, it's, it's currently a Pfizer site, but back then it was Wyeth before the merger. Uh, I was working in an oral solid doses area um, as a HVAC engineer. So going from validation of uh, sterilization equipment to a HVAC engineer was possible because of some of the courses we'd done in college, digging out psychrometric charts and, uh, you know, wet, wet and dry bulb temperatures, all that kind of stuff. Trying to remember how to do that after two years uh, was a lot easier probably than it would be now to try and do this. Uh, it was really interesting because there's so many HVAC units on that site. You got to walk a, walk a lot of the equipment, walk the site, really learn uh, how the process flows, what the impact of air is on clean rooms, you know, the importance of air change rates, uh, design of rooms, this, the, the placement of low level extracts, duct work, things that uh, make it possible to make, you know, drugs in a clean room environment. That was a really enjoyable job. Uh, towards the end of that uh, role, we were on a pilot scale plant for drug development. It was called the PDC project. Uh, I was there as a commissioning engineer. As part of that role, we got to uh, I got to work with roller compactors and granulators, uh, which were pretty cool, and uh, tablet coders, normal stuff. You know that you compress powders, uh, compact them homogenize them and then coat them with a sugar to make them, you know, stick together. Uh, and prior to the packaging of them and, and sending them out for shipment. Um, that role was really interesting, but unfortunately came to an end when Pfizer and Wyeth merged um, and there was a, a, like a call of people. So right after that, I was unemployed for about a week and a half. Um, 
which was a bit of a shock to the system because you know you don't really know if you know if what's coming up next and a week and a half could have been three months six months you wouldn't know with that particular time 2008 2010 you know it's the the dip in the housing crisis in the market but luckily enough pharma is you know fairly resilient and i was able to obtain a job in elan and at loan elan is currently called alchemies i think it was bought by alchemies four or five years ago it's another oral solid dosage plant uh i worked as a project engineer there uh project engineer is kind of a catch-all term for someone who does maybe a little bit of design a little bit of installation some qual you know someone who just gets it done um more or less so that was an interesting role i worked uh partly in the validation team as well uh doing fluid fluidized bed dryers I'm trying to remember now uh, we installed a clean room there, so I got more experience in you know, setting up a clean room, the facility type of um, the HVAC, the facility, uh, some utilities qualification, which was very good. Um, all the compressed gases, nitrogen for inertia, uh, clean water, you know, all of those things are regularly tested and commissioned and qualified prior to use to make sure that they meet a certain standard. Um, that was that was an interesting role. I was there for about a year, and then I took a job in MSD Carlo. MSD Carlo has just been set up at that point. It's an it's a an aseptic fill finish unit. Uh, as part of that project, I was the CKB team lead for the component prep area. So that uh, that was my first foray into people management, um, which at the time wasn't my <laughs> wasn't that suitable for for, for me. Uh, the the role itself comprised knowledge of autoclaves uh deep hydrogenation ovens all the sterilization equipment on site uh container closure integrity uh, is a big thing in an aseptic environment if you do the sterilization you have to maintain it sterile for a certain you know it doesn't last forever so you have to prove uh maybe using a helium leak detection system or some other method that a, a container retains its integrity and its sterility over a long period of time uh, the job itself would involve a little bit of uh, coordination. You'd have day-to-day, -day, you know, morning meetings, um, activities to schedule works on different pieces of equipment, uh, uh, deadlines to meet, and, and, and normal project stuff. The specifics of the job would involve kind of drafting documentation, uh, commissioning and, and qualification protocols, or reviewing and approving them for use. And then the actual thermal qualification of autoclave uh, loads. So an autoclave is a steam sterilizer uh, that uses, you know, replaces air with steam inside a, a box uh, and then uses the, con you know, the, the interaction of the, the saturated steam releasing its heat energy onto the surface of an object to, to, to kill any bio burden that might be on the surface adhering to it. That material that is then kept in a certain way and allowed to be processed in maybe an isolator or something that's in contact with the product to just, just to ensure you don't bring any of your contaminant with you as the process progresses. So I was there for a little while and, you know, as I said, people management at the time wasn't what I was looking for. I, I, at this point in my life, I was just after getting engaged and I, you know, started to think about things and I was, I was, I was considering all the skills that I learned in college and how I wanted to get a more, uh, get a job that would allow me to utilize them more, you know, basically do calculations, you know, heat transfer, mass transfer, anything like that. So I took a job with Jacobs Engineering in their Dublin office in Marion Gates. Uh, that was, that was definitely one of the more enjoyable jobs I've had. So after getting engaged, doing wedding planning and, um, you know, all this excitement going on in my personal life and getting the job that allowed me to do, you know, what I, what I trained for in college. I said, I'm staying in Dublin now. I'm not, I've done, I've done my commute to Athlone. and I've done my commute to Carlo. This is a Dublin based job where I live and I'm going to plan for my wedding. And the next thing you know, I was sent to Liverpool for nine months, um, which was brilliant. Uh, I worked in Elanco in Liverpool in the speak factory, uh, on a bio on a bioprocess, uh, drug, uh, for horses, for mastitis and horses. Um, it also allowed me to skip a big chunk of the wedding planning. So, you know, two thumbs up for that. Uh, while there, I got to commission Wifi systems, water for, uh, <laughs> uh, clean water, uh, which is like, uh, water for injection. Sorry, I couldn't remember what that acronym was. Water for injection is a, is a, a very clean water to a certain high standard, meaning it has no contaminants, bio burden, endotoxin, 
that can be injected into the human body without causing any um, inflammation or, or sickness. That's used to bulk up drugs or to make drugs. Um, so anyway, the commission and qualification of a wifi loop over there, along with uh, my introduction to chromatography, which was uh, new to me at the time, uh, that will become relevant later on. The, the speak job lasted for nine months after which I was brought back to Dublin, uh, the Dublin office. And um, then the next project was involved uh, working for Eli Lilly in Cork. So Eli Lilly at the time were thinking of, uh, we're actually building a factory out in China. And they had considered purchasing vessels through a, a normal European vendor or through a, an Asian vendor. And they decided to use Maramatsu in Shanghai for some of their buffer vessels. And my role was to go out to the factory in Shanghai and FAT them, factory acceptance test the vessels to make sure they were of the correct standard prior to, you know, paying for them and shipping them back to, to Ireland. This was a, a kind of strategic move on their part, you know, to make sure that the tanks were of a high enough quality that the next project out in China could, could, use, could use the same manufacturer or vendor. So that was a real eye opener. That was a really interesting job. Um, the difference is the, di the, the language barrier uh, was a little bit tricky, but seeing other processes and how, how the other, uh, how the, other uh, the Chinese workers were doing things, you learn a few things and it, you know, you can, you can take some stuff back with you as well. Uh, unfortunately, that was around the time when I was married. So again, we shipped out to China right after being married, made me super popular at home. After, after China, um, I got a really nice cushy number. I was sent to Austria uh, in uh, winter. So I got uh, an entire skiing season in uh, Graz in Southern Austria when we were, when we were um, F-18 bioreactors and uh, bioreactor skids for Zeta Pharma. That was a super, super interesting role. You got, to, you got to see them in construction, being manufactured, changes on the fly. Um, very, 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 very unique opportunity. So eventually I got back to Dublin and to my new wife and Jacobs took pity on me and allowed me to stay in the office and do some calculation files for a while. Did uh, the standard kind of heat transfer, mass transfer, all those kind of calculation files, uh, creating templates for future projects. And one of the projects I was working on was the new Amgen uh, site in Dunleary, which was the previous Pfizer Dunleary site. So I was uh, drafting process and instrumentation diagrams for those projects and spec and equipment and uh, ordering equipment, you know, for the new project. Uh, after, after a few months of doing that, I just transitioned from Jacobs to Amgen, uh, which is, you know, they were building the PM3 at the time, Project Hawk. It's at an aseptic fill finish facility again, but with slightly different technologies inside it. Uh, they had a really cool, uh, it's called an E-beam, an electron beam, a really high voltage sterilization method for uh, bombarding a tub of syringes. The exterior of the tub was like high voltage in order to sterilize it. Um, they had robots and they had, they had lots of really cool technology that, you know, if you're a bit of a, a science nerd, you get to play with and commission. Uh, it's really interesting. As part of that role, uh, I got into automation as well. So the actual code behind uh, the Delta V code or the, sorry, that was Rockwell. The code behind how the control systems for the environment work, you know, how the machinery works, opening and closing of valves, sequencing of cleaning places, steaming places, production activities, just to, you know, the nitty gritty of, of, of everything. Super, super interesting for, for me. Like, I really love the technical side at that point. Um, I stayed there for two and a half years and the project ended and I was so sad, but an opportunity then arose in Grange Castle and I haven't looked back. So... In 2016, uh, Pfizer Grange Castle were launching this product called Somatrogen. It's a, it's a dwarfism drug. I'm sorry, yes, yeah, dwarfism drug. Uh, Lino Messi takes it if, if you know if anyone's interested. The, the process itself was going to be the second drug introduced to the building called Drug Substance in, in Grange Castle, which is their you know their their proteins building. And it was slightly different. It involved facility modifications, new pipework installations some different technologies and uh, just a general change to a facility that has been operating in the same capacity for, you know, 15 years, making three batches a week. Each batch is like 50 million euro, huge, huge changes to something that's, you know, seen as really effective currently. 
challenges were in the working environment itself because of the, the scale of the impact that you need to do to make the new drug. Um, you had to, you know, and, and the fact that the expense of the drugs that you were supplanting were so high that you had to seek small little windows and do discrete bodies of work in order to maintain the current production plan or record without interruption. So that was a huge challenge, uh, considering that we had to use some of the same equipment in order to, you know, do the process. Uh, got to use a lot of my, I got to use some of my experience from uh, Elanco in the animal healthcare industry, you know, the chromatography info and some of my background with the FATs and, and, and some of the work on the bioreactors uh, and took that with me to Grange Castle where I, where I got to be the process design lead on uh, some of the equipment. In general, uh, this type of uh, plant will be set up as an upstream and a downstream. You know, the upstream is where you grow the cells from a vial up to, you know, a production bioreactor through cultivation. And then there's a harvest step and a purification step with the idea being that you're left up with a clear protein solution at the end that can be sent to somewhere like Amgen for fill finish into syringes. Um, my current role is equipment manager, so uh, the role has slightly changed. Um, still have maybe 50% technical uh, output, but now I'm a people manager as well. So a, a big chunk of my time is spent in individual uh, development plans for my team. I have a team of young engineers and scientists and trying to encourage them and, and mentor them as best as I can. God love them. Um, one of the other things that I'm doing at the minute is facility fits for new drugs. So um, in this particular case, you have several uh, Pfizer sites competing for the same drug, you know, because drugs are money and a great uh, chance to make money for the site and make it look good. So you have to come up with a plan to introduce the drug to your site, you know, scale it up appropriately, use some of your chemical engineering knowledge in the background uh, in biotech, and then uh, get it to work in your factory with the least input and cost and, and as fast as possible, for as cheap as possible. So a lot of challenges there. So a couple of the drugs we're working on are really interesting immunotherapy drugs for uh, different types of cancers, uh, some fusion proteins and, and, and lots of other stuff that uh, I need a much better understanding of science to go into. But the actual mechanics of it, you know, the pumping of the liquids, the controls, the chromatography, the off the, off the tangential filter flow, the final off the off, all of those kind of methods of purification um, are common across biotech and you probably see them on other sites like uh, Regeneron, MSD, SORS, BNS, you know, very trans, trans, uh, very useful knowledge to have. Um, that's, that's more or less where I am at the minute. So I thought I might just take you through maybe what it looks like in terms of biotech. Um, so I hope I'm not boring anyone, but this is an example of a, a typical downstream biotech process. So uh, in the first instance there on the left, we have a production bioreactor. That's usually maybe either in this case is 2000 liters of uh, a media and cell culture mixed together, you know, with protein in it. Uh, or it could be 12,000 liters, you know, if you're in the, in the bigger part of the factory. This particular case is a single use technology. So the, the item you're seeing on the left of the screen there is simply just a holder. It's a fancy bucket that holds a a sterilized irradiated bag uh, with 2000 liters of liquid. Inside that liquid, you have you know, your cells that have excreted the protein after being spiked. Right after that, you're into clarification territory. You're, you know, this, this is the cake is made. You now you're trying to cut it into small slices and, and, and divvy it up. The next step is the centrifugation process. So the centrifugation happens and the, the waste matter is discarded. The solid, heavy cell walls and material are thrown away. And, the discharge and you're retaining a supernatant with uh, some protein and, and, and some carrier buffer. Uh, you might have one or two chromatography steps there, either for removing impurities or for uh, further purification or buffer exchange. Um, off off ultrafiltration, diafiltration is another method of buffer exchange. So there's usually a target because uh, you're trying to you're trying to meet the same criteria that the process development guys used uh, to create the product in the lab. So after Chrome 2, for example, you might be expecting to have five grams per liter, but you currently have, you know, two grams per liter. So there's a concentration step required. Ultrafiltration does that. You just literally run your product across the tangential filter. 
and retain the cells and lose the liquid. And then the diafiltration is the buffer exchange to get it into the right carrier medium for the next step. You know, the right pH, the right conductivity, the right salt contrast, something very important uh, that's different for each product. And your final one there is your drug substance vessel. So your bulk drug, sub drug substance. This is a live product, it's protein. Uh, it has to be frozen. So it's usually frozen to minus 70 degrees. The transit of this item, is, you know, if you can imagine that's worth 50 million. So it's a 200 liters uh, vessel frozen to minus 70, worth 50 million. Extremely, extremely important how you take care of that. Uh, the transit of that from our site to maybe our sister site in Poors where it might do fill finish or, you know, for example, Amgen, not that we do that, but to Amgen up the road. Every, every step of the process, that has to be monitored. You wouldn't let it out of your site. You have to know the temperatures, maintain that. All of these things are important. Every aspect of the industry is so regulated and controlled. Um, I hope no one has any further questions than that in a minute. But in general, right, my, my last slide, you know, I promise, I, I know I'm talking, talking, I should have timed myself. But if I can give any advice, because I, I give advice to young uh, mentees at the minute, and the number one thing I see, because I do a lot of interviews as well, is if you're ever doing an interview, be prepared. There's a huge amount of company literature available, company behaviors, the, the leadership values. They call it different things, but they basically tell you up front what you are to display inside an interview, you know, how you're to answer questions. A lot of the websites, you know, actually give you a formula on how to, how to respond. But like, if you're applying for a job with me, I'm going to assume you're smart. You know, you're, you're an engineer, you're a scientist, you're something that we want to hire. It's, it's your enthusiasm, your personality, and your preparedness that will, will bring you across the line. Uh, your first job generally isn't that important. Just get your foot in the door as soon as possible. Then start planning. What do you want to do? Who do you want to emulate? What do you want to, you know, pick a trajectory and then plan it out. How are you going to get there? Talk to people. People are really friendly in our industry. They'll definitely give you as much advice or, you know, their, their history as they can. Definitely, uh, <laughs> this, is a, this is a typical engineering mistake. Don't neglect the people side. Uh, emotional intelligence is hugely important. You know, you're going to be working in teams. No matter how smart you are, you can't do an entire project yourself. And you'll be working across functional teams. And a lot of what we end up doing, because our skills are a bit, you know, our, the breadth of our skills are, and the very, very nature of our skills is, you end up being a bit of a Rosetta Stone between functional groups, you know, like between automation, between tech services, tech ops, engineering, uh, other types of engineering, sorry, our operations. They all have local jargon and local lingo, and we end up maybe communicating on understanding what they mean, but not exactly what they're saying. So that, you know, do not neglect people because uh, there's, so, there's stuff there that you need as well. And finally, just you should spend at least 10% of your time doing career management. You know, have a plan, figure out what you want and aim for it. Um, no one will hand it to you. And it's really easy. Just keep a little work journal. You know, what, what are you thinking you're going to get at the start of the project? What did you actually get at the end of the project? You know, skills that you're trying to knock off your list. Uh, something along those lines there. Uh, something we developed at Pfizer, you know, like a little work journal just to keep your progress ticking along. Some, some core skills that you need for a certain role and then a metric. And then continuously look at that metric every couple of weeks or every couple of months just to show your progress. You know, it, it helps with your motivation as well. So it's a very useful tool. All right. I'm going to talk, stop talking now before Michal interrupts me and tells me I'm, I should shut up. <laughs> Not at all, David. That was really, really fantastic. And uh, just before I hand over to Philip, and I'll allow Philip a second to get ready. I just want to say like that was uh, truly incredible. There's so many themes that can be picked up upon, like whether it was your first number of years, uh, like with Pfizer and Wyeth, like such solid uh, foundation of your career. The next five years, like being able to travel all over the world and lead engineering projects, like that was a really uh, interesting part now. And I think now even like as and you, people lead in like in your own uh, role, um, the young engineers that you're um, supervising, looking over, they're very fortunate to have you. Um, so that was really perfect. And that was exactly what we were looking for. So uh, thank you so much, David. Um, so yeah, I'd like to hand over to Philip Healy, who is um, the chair of the ICME uh, All Ireland Member Group, and I invited Philip here this evening to uh, maybe respond um, to the uh, two presentations to forward and to add his uh, own insights. Uh, so, Philip, over to you, and thank you so much again. Uh, that's great. Thank you very much, Michal. And uh, first of all, thank you to our two previous speakers for some very illuminating uh, talks. 
I'm not going to spend too long talking on, because I think I'd like to give the opportunity to the um, grad to the student and graduate members who are here this evening to to be able to ask questions. And I will be able, I'll be I'll be around for as long as is necessary to answer questions after this formal um, after the formal kind of presentations are done. So I suppose just a very brief introduction to me is um, I, I was kind of smiling to myself because the previous two speakers are people who have great careers still in front of them and I'm probably a man who has most of his great career behind him. Um, I graduated from Cork Regional Technical College as it then was, it's now the Munster Technological University uh, in 1994 and since then I've, I did some initial work in the pharmaceutical consultancy and I worked in environmental consultancy uh, and I was, I was one of the first people to be working in IPC licensing and in environmental licensing uh, for, for those industries. I spent some time in the nuclear industry in the UK. I spent some time in the electronics industry and I've worked abroad as well in uh, Eastern Europe, uh, England and Scotland. And I've worked all around Ireland and I've actually worked in every company that has been mentioned so far. I have uh, been on site as a commissioning engineer or a design engineer in, uh, or as a safety uh, engineer in MSD Ballydyne, in uh, Pfizer Grange Castle, in Pfizer Dun Mary, in Jacobs Engineering. I currently work as an independent contractor and I principally work for PM Group, who many of you would have heard of. I currently work in the area, area of process engineering safety and you know, I do a lot of chemical engineering safety and chairing of HAZOPs and other, um, I suppose, jobs like that. I suppose my first reaction really to the two speakers is, and this is uh, advice to everybody here, is your career is going to change and you will be able to control some of that change because you'll be able to plan and some of the change is going to be thrust upon you. So I think, you know, uh, our second speaker there, he gave, you know, David, he said, you know, there was times he was out of work, it wasn't for long, but it, it happens. It, it, it has happened to me once or twice. And the best way is to just be a flexible person with skills that are transferable. So I would say just be aware that in your career, reverses and curves are going to come along and you, you may have to, you know, take a bit of time to sit down, prepare a CV and then go job hunting. And I think the second good point that David made was that his first foray into personnel management wasn't at a time when he particularly wanted to do it. And again, it's going to happen in your careers that sometimes you may be tasked with working in an area that perhaps you don't want to do long term. But I would say don't be, you know, don't be reluctant to do it for short term to be at least able to say that you gave it a go and then that you made an informed decision on whether it was for you or not. And I, and I would say that David made the right choice. You know, he gave it a go, worked on other things, did lots of sums, and then he is now in a role where he is, um, I suppose, involved in both technical uh, decision-making and in, you know, helping personnel and stuff like that. Um, I suppose the other thing I would say is, again, you're all smart people and you're all technically competent, which means that you will, you will be able to do sums and you will, you will be able to apply those sums to real world engineering solutions. So they're not just numbers on the page, but you'll be able to relate, relate those numbers to 3D equipment in the field, whether you're sizing a pump or sizing an agitator or sizing a bioreactor or checking fluid flow or checking emissions calculations if you're in the environmental field or checking gas concentrations if you're in the safety field and so on and so on. So you'll be able to do all of those but I would say if I was to look back on my 25 years of work is that it's to focus on those things that make your technical job easier. So be very good at time management, be very good at task management. And I, I would have probably, it's only in the last few years that I started buying books on time management, personnel management and all that. But these are skills that are good for you no matter what role you're working in in the chemical engineering field. So rather than, me, rather than me saying to you this evening, you should be doing distillation or you should be doing biotech or you should be doing nuclear or you should be doing electronics. You know, you'll find those things which you like, but the things which will make your job easier are 
being able to manage your own time, being able to manage your own manager frequently and to be able to, you know, give value to your employer that way. And I think the other thing then is always be learning. You know, it's it just constantly be not only learning on the job, but doing a lot of extra reading and enjoying it really, which is again what David kind of alluded to. So I said, I said that's just some very general general advice um, in reaction to, specifically to David's points. And I think to our first speaker, Caroline, again, we work in a very different environment nowadays when there's much more knowledge and appreciation of coming from, of, uh, we're trying to get people into engineering from diverse backgrounds. And I suppose I came in the, in the mid nineties and throughout the two thousands, what was ver a very traditional, heavily male orientated, although not so much chemical engineering wise, because that tends to approach or attract more women than some of the other engineering disciplines. So I suppose there, it, I, I think it's a good thing that we have more diverse backgrounds in our engineers nowadays, uh, in terms of either in gender or in terms of coming from other countries to work in Ireland and be willing to do what they did to go abroad, to travel and to give people a chance wherever you are. So some of that is fairly general advice, but as I said, if people have specific questions during the Q&A session, then I think I would be able to give more direct answers and, and the other speakers as well. So I don't know, Michal, is that, is that useful or not? That was very useful. And um, I think there, then I might end the recording there and trans, uh, transcend into the Q&A. Thank you, does that sound good, Philip? Rock and roll, yeah. Okay.